My name is Andrew Moore. I grew up in England, uh, came to the United States in 1990, and I do machine learning and artificial intelligence. I was really inspired by ELISA uh, when I first read about it, and I had one of these tiny little 8-bit machines uh, that people had in the 1980s and wrote my own ELISA and that was really inspiring to me. So ELISA was one of these first programs where you could type random things into a computer and the computer would pick up on words uh, that you typed in and give apparently sensible replies. And uh, so it felt like you were talking to an actual artificial intelligence system. So that was inspiring. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was clear even to me as a young stupid kid that it was kind of a parlor trick. It wasn't anything like real intelligence, but it was still amazing to imagine that we might be able to get computers to do some of the intelligent things that humans can. Yeah, so that's a really interesting social foundation, even if it's based on um, elements of trickery. Yes, I think uh, uh, I really liked science fiction growing up, like many, many kids did. Uh, this is going to sound incredibly childish, but at the age of about 14 or 15, a friend and I set up something where we claimed to have invented a really good uh, new AI system, and I was hiding in his attic, uh, <laughs> remotely controlling answers from a supposed AI system, and we had a whole bunch of friends who were like absolutely shocked. Wow, is the CIA going to come in and take this over? So uh -huh. that was fun for a while while it lasted, and it was really like inspiring to imagine what if there is some other kind of intelligence we can converse with. Mm -hmm. I'm really struck by the social element, actually, in all of this, Yes. whether you're hoodwinking or not. Back um, in my PhD days, uh, I was particularly interested in whether robots could learn. And this was uh, uh, before a great deal of research had subsequently happened in the world of robotics. And uh, so we were just playing with robot arms and having them do tasks and seeing if you could make them improve themselves during that process. Mm -hmm. Now for me personally, I changed a lot during that process of doing the PhD because at first I really did start the project with the idea of trying to simulate how, how humans or animals may be learnt and I was really fascinated by that. But something happened to me during the PhD and I got more fascinated by just the algorithmic question of how can I make this happen as effectively as possible? I don't care whether it's human-like or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a split which you often see happening in the field of artificial intelligence. Those are two completely valid, really important and interesting questions. How can we understand the phenomenon of intelligence through simulating it or trying to implement it versus how can we make something which is making really good practical decisions but is not necessarily using any of the kind of processes that real creatures use? Uh, when I started teaching artificial intelligence here, I asked a friend from Australia, a guy called Ray Bunting, how he taught AI. And he's, his answer was, don't, don't try to understand how the brain behaves. Try to understand how the brain should behave which is an incredibly arrogant way of putting, like, we humans, we can do a better job of trying to uh, uh, make intelligence work. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing, of course, is in lots of uh, pretty superficial ways, we do see absolute superhuman performance uh, of computers. Most computers are much better at arithmetic than most humans are, and there's many of these other things where we thought that there was some sort of brilliant thought going on where, in fact, as we understand it computationally, we realize, nope, you actually didn't need a notion of natural intelligence to accomplish it. Yeah. So on some level, it seems almost like a false comparison to make the comparison to the human brain in terms of the super notion, because on some level, the processes ideally are a departure from at least our conventional understandings of, of learning and thinking within the human constraint. Is that fair to say? Yes. I don't think uh, it would ever make sense to complain that the people trying to understand biological intelligence are doing something stupid, nor the engineers who are just trying to build to systems to make autonomous or intelligent decisions are misguided. They're just two separate efforts which hopefully can 
can build from each other, but I don't think we should be confused into thinking that that should all be lumped into one scientific discipline. I'm going to give you one example which continues to this day to really inspire me. Mm -hmm. uh, and it comes, I believe, from Herb Simon. This is the example which I use when folks at the moment ask me, well, looks like computers have caught up with humans now, they're just as smart. And of course, I don't believe that at all. Mm -hmm. I actually do think that we, in engineering artificial intelligence, are just paddling around in the very shallowest uh, waters when it comes to actually simulating anything which we might emo remotely uh, describe as the intelligence of an animal or a human. And so here's the, the big example. Uh, and you guys might already know it, in which case you can tell me to fast forward. It's called the uh, chessboard problem. I'm holding in my hands an imaginary chessboard. As you know, that's uh, eight columns and eight rows, uh, 64 squares in all, and they're uh, diagonally patterned with black, white, black, white uh, in this nice diagonal uh, pattern. So uh, if I have a bunch of 32 dominoes, where each domino covers two squares, uh, I can give you a puzzle, which is can you cover the whole chessboard with these 32 dominoes? And if I take a typical chessboard, of course, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can do it neatly, or you can do it in all kinds of weird and interesting patterns. But most folks, uh, uh, I'm sure uh, many three- and four-year-old kids would be able to do that. Now, uh, the, this, this special problem is when you say, I'm going to cut off two of the corners, top left-hand corner and the bottom right-hand corner, and uh, ask the question, can you now cover the chessboard with 31 dominoes? Because I've taken away two squares, uh, but so now it's a more interesting problem, and many people will spend a while trying to figure that out. Uh, now, humans, uh, after a while, usually realize something as they start to get frustrated about this, which is that taking off those two diagonal corners, it's hard to see this in a word picture, but in reality, you've taken off two corners which are the same color. Mm -hmm. So let's say we've just chopped off two white uh, pieces, and a human might think, you know what, every domino that I place on this chessboard has to cover one white and one black square on the chessboard, and so uh, I've now got more black squares than white squares, it cannot be done. So the human will just stop at that point. Here's what I find inspiring, and I'm not sure if all my colleagues in the world of artificial intelligence would agree, but for me, I believe that we as a field have completely forgotten to even look at a question like that. We do not have technology, nor to my knowledge is anyone working on the technology to implement that kind of thinking outside the system type of reasoning. We are so good at within the box reasoning. If instead of a chessboard and dominoes, you're looking at optimizing the movements of Uber drivers throughout a city to stop wasting fuel or something, Computers are far, far better than humans at coming up with near optimal solutions. But when it comes to anything where you're jumping outside your current reasoning and doing something maybe like making an analogy with something else, we just don't know how to do that. So that to me, I think this partly answers the question you sort of initially brought up of what are the examples of things which really sort of show the difference between the sort of biologically plausible ways of thinking and the ways that we engineers are actually doing it. I think it's true because I think we all, when we're talking about machines or other things, we anthropomorphize them. Even clearly non-smart machines, like an umbrella blowing away in the wind or something, we just cannot stop ourselves from anthropomorphizing. And so it's very easy if you're having to talk about something which is actually sort of acting like it's got intention to just make that assumption while you're talking about it, and uh, I think in this particular case, as you're indicating, it confuses everyone because we aren't actually talking about something which has got intention. We are just talking about a bunch of rules firing uh, automatically. It's a good question because I do think we're at a very critical time for discussions about artificial intelligence. Uh, the 
responsibilities I feel are first, it is probably completely rational that many folks in the public are concerned about what AI means. Uh, and I, the first thing I would say is I feel a real responsibility not to minimize those concerns. Uh, like all technologies, uh, AI can easily cause problems or actually cause disasters. Uh, and it's someone in my position, we see so many optimistic things all the time, just amazing uses of technologies to help save lives or keep people out of danger or solve injustices and this sort of thing. Of course, we're naturally optimistic, and uh, but I cannot just bring that in front of the camera when I'm discussing it because uh, every other major technological revolution, although we're glad that they happened, caused absolute sort of brutality, her br brutally horrific things to happen to certain segments of the population as they were going on. Uh, and this one could be the same, but based on our knowledge of history and hopefully a better understanding of how social cohesion works, uh, we could do a better job right now if we're realistic about the impacts. Uh, the, there's a discussion topic which I think is really confusing everyone, which I don't like, and this is the fear of super intelligent machines. I, and my answer to that is not to dismiss that fear, it's just that is such a minor concern compared with other things which are much more likely to happen, and in particular the malicious use of artificial intelligence, not an AI itself mysteriously turning into a psychopath that wants to kill humans, but just some uh, uh, state actor or terrorist actor deciding to use very advanced technology to uh, dramatically, uh, if I can put it this way, improve the efficiency of their killing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a super serious danger. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that is something I would like to see us getting ready for and beginning to address. And I feel like the somewhat more attractive and appealing science fiction discussions about the nature of consciousness and self-directed intelligence, so much more attractive to talk about that we're kind of not discussing these very mundane, but actually quite dangerous possibilities. I might not spend enough time discussing the importance of clear communication. What I do really focus on is the responsibility that comes with being one of the builders of these very advanced pieces of technology. And so it is to some extent a double-edged sword, uh, and I'll explain what I mean here. One important way to inspire folks to come into this discipline and to be sort of open your arms to be inviting, not to make it seem like something that's only for a small subset of the population, is to talk about the fact that uh, within the world and society we have at the moment, there are only a few things you can do to really influence uh, the future. Uh, and how things are going to be. One of those is technology. And so the importance, the, if you like, the, uh, uh, the fragility of the current state of the planet and human society is a really good reason to get involved in uh, activities which can keep the world safer. And so Folks in my position are able to really articulate that in a way that uh, means that we're speaking to 13-year-olds and 16-year-olds about that sort of inspiration. And a, I think a lesson that's been learnt in education for uh, maybe over the last decade or so is that this is how you begin the communication about getting folks into science and technology, in particular computer science, as opposed to beginning with saying, like, do you like computer games? Would you know how to build them? Which is a whole different way, a much less inspiring way of bringing folks in. 
Now, I called it a double-edged sword to use this motivation to bring folks in, because we can't just inspire by saying, do this because it's an awesome responsibility. We do still have to then follow up. And when I talk to graduating classes, uh, that's the main focus for that class, is you've now developed a, a huge amount of skill, uh, which you can use to be some of the probably most uh, leveraged agents of change uh, in the history of the human race. Uh, but you have a big responsibility that goes with that. So my discussions with students at sort of that level are usually about the level of responsibility. And it, frankly, until this conversation, I hadn't specifically thought about the issues of uh, helping make sure that they can have useful uh, 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 ability to present and discuss the issues with, with the rest of the world. Yeah, because I think we're in an interesting moment um, not too different from some of the revolutionary artists, where artists at certain moments could say, let my work speak for itself. I, it seems to me that the, the generation of technologists that will be graduating in the coming years will not be in a position to just allow the tools or the systems to speak for themselves, but they'll be considered authors and makers of those systems as well that may have intended but also unintended consequences. So that ability to communicate on that could be, could be an important role. That's true. Now, I want to push a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. The analogy with uh, uh, artists who will produce something and then can say, I want to let it speak for themselves, mm -hmm. that is a creative act where the artist usually goes away and, based on their own experiences, constructs something to then present. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the big lessons of product management and design through research uh, over the last couple of decades has been you cannot develop useful software or even and certainly not artificial intelligence systems by going away into a dark room producing something and then presenting it so uh, I think it's equally important to talking about something after you've produced it is the communication that goes in in the design of a system mm -hmm. so uh, uh, this is something for example which uh, as I'm working with uh, the Department of Defense at the moment on how to help introduce artificial intelligence responsibly there. The number one discussion topic is how to make sure that you're working with the people who are going to be using the technology or relying on the technology and discussing that with them you know, every day almost, certainly every week in these sort of agile uh, development methodologies where you are all discussing about how things are going to be when the product is complete. So I, mm -hmm. I guess I would passionately say the communication responsibility is stronger for the engineers because they have to be communicating during the conception and initial implementation of something rather than just explaining it afterwards. In some places, the uh, the introduction of automation. I'm not, I don't really want to spend a lot of effort trying to decide whether the automation is AI or something else. Sure. Uh, has displaced jobs but not caused, uh, shall we say, uh, a loss overall of jobs. And of course the, uh, the introduction of ATMs, cash mm -hmm. machines, is a great example where uh, the role of the bank teller really did change into more discussions with uh, the customers, but you actually at no point during the introduction of these things, which completely replaced a large fraction of a bank teller's time, did you actually see a reduction in employment in the banking industry where it just moved into more services, uh, more presumably higher value services, or at least uh, more marketing services to work with customers. And that is the nicest case. This happens, of course, also in the introduction of office technology, where people whose job was to sort of take dictation and write letters, uh, that, that particular role disappeared, but the number of administrative folks working in organizations doing more, uh, what we might call uh, more demanding cognitive tasks to do with how to present information and communicate it, are, uh, are, are growing. So these are the happy cases where having automation has helped 
people perhaps get to do some of the more interesting things in their jobs rather than what might be described as grunge work. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, another example of this is uh, in, uh, there's a local robotics company called Bossa Nova Robotics, which has a robot which wanders around the aisles of supermarkets looking for uh, things which are out of stock. And the reception in every time when it's been uh, rolled out, the reception by the workers in these supermarkets has been very positive because it was an aspect of their jobs which is causing great frustration that uh, everyone got stressed out and angry when things were out of space on the shelves. And uh, so this has just resulted in folks doing a better job at their work. Uh, the places where it's uh, more frightening to me in terms of what it does to people are in things like uh, self-driving or other aspects where there's a clear job role which is just going to be switched off. And I don't think there will be time for folks to adjust to the uh, ability to do higher value uh, activities uh, instead of the self-driving. So those are the ones where I expect to see a much more painful and actually a much angrier uh, response to the introduction of advanced technology. It's a very interesting question about what this kind of introduction of artificial intelligence does to human dignity and the the immediate question that was in my mind is, is this different from when uh, owners of stables started to lose their jobs as horses are replaced with cars? Uh, That's a good comparison. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and of course there's, uh, there's, there's, there's songs and poems about uh, when, when humans have been, were replaced by machinery uh, during the 19th century uh, and, and the effects on dignity. So, You've got me wondering, is this one going to be different? Uh, I think it's a... From a sort of class system, social-based view, I think uh, the interesting thing is that what has traditionally been regarded as white-collar work for the educated classes is now as much under attack as what might have been regarded as blue collar or low skilled work. And so, uh, you know, the sort of uh, closet socialist in me thinks, well, at least that's fair. <laughs> that's, uh, maybe, <laughs> I'm not sure if I want that to actually go out in that way, so I've got to be careful about how I say it. <laughs> Let me have a, uh, and of course, you can use it if you want to. Let me have another way of uh, saying this. Uh, given that much, his, the, much of the history of technology has in, seems to have involved the uh, unskilled, lowest paced workers, paid workers getting uh, the, the rawest end of the deal as automation comes in. I think this one is different in the sense that you will see uh, all levels of either status or uh, pay getting uh, attacked uh, equally. Uh, that there will be jobs which currently might be regarded as uh, blue-collar jobs which will remain wholeheartedly safely there for the next 50 or 100 years, like a community police officer, uh, there's absolutely no way that you're going to have just autonomous robots patrolling an area. There, there really are human interactions needed there. Whereas someone who uh, is actually really good at reading legal contracts, looking for uh, potential dangers which other folks won't have spotted, that, that really apparently uh, impressive skill might just get suddenly uh, automated out of existence and then that will be a big a big hit on someone's feeling of self-worth if this skill that they might have trained for many years for has suddenly been uh, automated away. Yeah, We could probably talk about it all day but it, it would be interesting to see the ways in which different AI learning tools could be leveraged for that pivot in terms of skill development for retraining yes. and how adept certain populations would be versus others in, in working in those ways, how adept governments are to actually facilitate the development yes. of such programs to anticipate these shifts or if we will actually repeat those uh, atrocities of sorts from the past. 
Yes, one thing which was really impressive, I believe, about the United States at the start of this, of the previous century, as mass manufacturing uh, came into existence, the, that was when the government said, right, we're going to have to make sure that everyone gets educated up to age 16, because the whole space of work is going to be much more highly skilled. And they really saw this happening, and I don't quite know how they did it, but it was absolutely critical because at the same time that the automation was coming in, they upskilled the nation. Previous revolutions, the agricultural revolution had not done that. Mm -hmm. And the thing which I find sad is I'm not seeing us doing something equivalent uh, this time around either. We're obviously paying lip service to the importance of education, but we're not seeing anywhere near the investment or relative investment that we did in the previous major re revolution. So one common place where power is transferred is something which I actually don't think a lot of people really like, which is in sales and negotiations. So in the advertising industry, there was quite a strong profession and career to be had to be someone who is on the phone all day talking to clients who want to advertise products and services and venues that can put them there and really building up a social network of interactions and trust where you help take the right piece of marketing to the right audience through understanding what's going on. And it was an incredibly social and complex uh, thing based on like years of building up trust between groups uh, and really trying to sort of convince people that the marketing campaign you'd put in place was having an effect based on something or another. And that is something which has been really changed by the sort of advent of online advertising and the fact that such a large fraction of people's exposure to advertising is coming online at this point because folks have been able to bring in automated systems to automatically figure out where it's going to be most effective to show what to whom. And so there you've seen, uh, I think, a generation of folks who were really good and actually very creative about putting together uh, campaigns of various kinds, uh, really being replaced by linear algebra and logistic regression and, and things like that. So that has been a, a big one. There are now dashboards, quite complicated dashboards for big advertising uh, engines. Like if, if you happen to be someone who's really good at reading uh, the graphs of the performance of a Google campaign or Facebook analytics and you can start tweaking some of the knobs on your campaign which often are knobs to do with telling the AI what high level goals to shoot for that now is a good living and a pretty well paid job. One of the uh, people on the, the School of Computer Science Advisory Board is Bruce Cleveland, a venture capitalist who has set up a training school in Oregon for folks who have been displaced from some of the manufacturing industries there to manage these kinds of knobs on these advertising campaigns and is able to actually help give them actually interesting jobs now in managing the AIs who are doing the marketing which were then themselves jobs stolen away from the earlier generation of human social marketers. So I guess that's overall a story where something which seemed to be a profession based on relationships and trust and persuasion has now turned into a much more numerical, uh, optimized uh, industry, but there are still people uh, employed within it. Uh, they're just doing a very different kind of job. For many years, uh, when it comes to marketing, you had clients who were, say, a manufacturing company or a retail chain who wanted folks to be aware of what's going on. And the way that the marketers would sort of try to demonstrate that they were doing a good job was sort of meetings with cups of coffee or glasses of wine, uh, where they talk about all the good that their campaign has been doing, often with anecdotes and, you know, board meeting type discussions. Uh, and suddenly that's been swept away. And this thing which was based on folks on either side of those relationships knowing each other and trusting each other, they don't have to trust each other anymore because they can just see the metrics uh, 
of how many click-throughs they get or how many sales as a result of click-throughs that they got. And so in fact the automation in this industry has taken away some of the uh, need for this kind of uh, persuasion of the quality of your service. Now in some ways you can view this as sort of sad, something which was exactly what we humans are good at, communicating and trading ideas has been taken away. On the other hand, it's probably a good thing that it's now a much more transparent industry and if you're doing a bad job but you're able to talk your way out of your underperformance, it's actually harder to do that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, typical, I guess, uh, trade-off there as the world gets more metric and measured and transparent you are displacing folks whose job was previously to sort of smooth out the fact that there wasn't the clear data around to, uh, to deal with. So perhaps more transparent, but certainly also more transactional. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think I'd like to go for two different uh, places where uh, this is a concern for me. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them so the first place where I think we might conceivably make all our lives crappier uh, would be if uh, we are so monitored that we feel we have to take actions that we don't really want to in order to uh, be approved of, if you like. So I'll give you a, an example from the old days was uh, maybe someone who bought a subscription to The Economist magazine would have got ranked in some marketing database as a likely high earner and so they would be given more special offers to uh, get opportunities to sort of partake in nice vacations or something. So that was a, that example which is more from the old days is something where a person who perhaps didn't even care about The Economist might conceivably have said I better subscribe to this thing just so that I look good. You could argue that some higher education uh, certificates or degree programs might have some of the same flavor where even if you're not quite sure that you're going to be learning a useful skill, you better get it anyway because getting that label uh, will help you. So imagine what would happen if that really did get down to the micro level where if I tend to be someone who bounces on my chair a lot, uh, there's a, an actual indication that maybe in 10 years time I'm more likely to be in a, uh, a lawsuit regarding uh, uh, interior decoration or something. Uh, then I then have on my app, it warns me about this, it says, hey Andrew, you're bouncing around in your chair a lot. It doesn't really matter except that we think there's these other predictive models out there which are going to give you a negative score, so stop behaving that way. Wouldn't that be awful if we actually find that because we're being tracked, we actually start to need to change our behavior so that we look good to the algorithms that are tracking us. If I happen to like dropping, out at a, dropping off at a junk food burger bar once or twice a week, but then I hear that uh, some algorithms have associated that with unlikeliness of paying back debits, uh, bingo, I will have to stop having my awesome cheap burgers and start to just eat alfalfa sprouts or whatever the high credit people eat. There are some areas of technology where it is getting really complicated to go back to first principles to explain something. Uh, and obviously particle physics is one which really annoys me in that I would love to understand it but no matter how much I watch Nova specials on it or something, I'm never really going to get it and I'm just sitting there trying to sort of get a sense of what's going on. Uh, what's been going on with computer science is pretty similar, right? With there's so many stacked layers of technologies on top of each other that we can, almost none of us can really sort of explain how everything works when uh, Siri uh, answers a question, uh, tells you what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. Because uh, there's so many different layers. Mm -hmm. So as a result of this, uh, we have definitely moved to a world where some of us can handle it when people talk about technology and know kind of enough that we don't freak out that we can't follow every step. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would worry that 
for many people who aren't trained in computer science, they will regard this the same way that I regard particle physics. It's just some alien random thing going on, which means that we can't really expect to invest time in uh, understanding it, which means that when we're asked to help make policy decisions, like uh, voting for a politician who has a particular stand on privacy or net neutrality, we don't feel qualified to make that sort of decision. So that's the other concern. I would not really blame anyone necessarily, but there's such specialization and expertise in these things which affect all of society. It's much harder to have a typical sort of democratic discussion where most of the folks do kind of roughly understand the forces in play. Yes, so at the moment I think it is very important that people like students at Carnegie Mellon and faculty or our, or our uh, alumni really do help out in briefing like aides on Capitol Hill or uh, politicians who are trying to figure out what stand they should take on something, uh, help them understand that stuff. Mm -hmm. What I would like to believe, maybe it'll happen somewhere uh, that's annoyingly well adjusted like Finland or something, <laughs> is that uh, <laughs> policymakers and lawmakers will actually have so much training that they are able to, uh, you know, when they're in the middle of debating whether or not a certain kind of technology should be allowed on traffic lights to detect pedestrians, the answer might be something like, well, no, there's no way you can do that sort of detection in real time because the latency is going to be too large from a, a round trip to a data center. It'd be really good to hear a legislator complaining like that in the middle of a discussion. The on the <laughs> yeah, that's right. right? Uh, I really like the idea of machines helping out when human nervous systems are not fast enough to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So the notion of sudden last minute interventions to pre prevent disaster seem like a clear win. That by itself is enough for me to say we should be working on this. I really do want uh, to see in transportation or buildings or disaster response for systems to be working out like as a beam is falling what it's going to do to save a person. And so that's a place where there is no chance of having a human decision maker there in the moment and so you have to build in autonomy. There are a few others, uh, such as uh, you know, exploration in network denied environments, like searching in a uh, in a collapsed mine for uh, miners, uh, and things involving space exploration and so forth. Uh, so that's the first place where I take a view which might not be popular that. Artificial intelligence research should be looking at building full autonomous systems as well as the more traditional, I think actually more uh, reassuring aspect of artificial intelligence, which is to build advisors for humans to make better decisions. The other place for autonomy is when you have uh, much too much information for humans. So if, imagine after a tsunami, uh, you have 25,000 drones launched over a region, uh, each sort of sweeping a 20 foot by 20 foot area looking for people who are struggling in the water. Uh, those things among themselves are going to have to quickly coordinate what information to get back to a rescuer. You're not going to be able to have 25,000 people manually piloting each of those 25,000 drones. And so again, it helps to have things where we humans can concentrate on the important stuff and let the machines take care of the routine stuff. So, I mentioned earlier, I am genuinely worried about intentional, malicious, harmful robots being used. Uh, uh, my understanding of international law is it's not legal to make systems, for instance, which will seek out an individual to kill them. But if a rogue state or even one of the big powers starts to make those things, I want to make sure that we have technology to counter them. Uh, so 
this is, this is a very different uh, kind of answer to the ones where we've also got to be making sure that we're educating our scientists and engineers to like, be well enough informed not to produce those kinds of devastating pieces of technology. But uh, uh, I still want to make sure that we're ready for that kind of behavior. Uh, and we've, we saw in the last month the examples of drones being used in an attempted assassination. There will be more of that. I, for me, the, the idea of trying to do general artificial intelligence is kind of interesting, but it is, it is like talking about interplanetary or interstellar travel. It's, it's a whole other area that folks can explore. For me, the idea of fully general artificial intelligence, which is somehow uh, beginning to actually equal what we humans are capable of, uh, is an interesting long-term goal but it is not what 99.99% .99 of all the AI engineers and scientists in the world are doing. And the ones who are doing it, uh, I think they've got a lot of work ahead of them. And so it would be uh, probably a mistake to assume that we're going to see fruition from that work in the next few decades.